Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Couple of connected questions for us all today, followed by a review. Those questions being, what's wrong with Mido? Or perhaps more accurately, why does nobody talk about Mido. Now, I have to be careful here that I'm not projecting. I'm aware that this is subjective, this is my opinion, but I have been running this channel now for over four years. I've made 700 videos and I have reviewed one Mido in that time. And you know what? Can I be honest? I actually forgot entirely that I had reviewed it, which is kind of surprising considering it had a rainbow colored dial, but there you go. Now, Mido are part of the Swatch group of companies and they have been part of the Swatch group since 1985, so 30 to 40 odd years, but I don't quite know what Swatch have done with the brand over that period of time. I just don't think that they have the strength that some of the other Swatch group products have, the same strong brand identity identities that some of the other Swatch Group's products have at their price point. So this is a graphic of the Swatch Group of companies and you can see where Mido fit in. They are wedged between Certina and Hamilton and sit just underneath Tiso. They're kind of in that not quite entry level. They're certainly above Flick Flack and Swatch. They're in that kind of entry level Swiss auto bracket. Now those other companies that are around Mido in that umbrella I think have got much much stronger identities. Tiso, for example. Tiso have made two of the best big brand budget watches of the last couple of years in the form of the PRX and the Gentleman. I think the Gentleman is probably the best sleeper everyday watch you can buy for less than a thousand dollars. A whole bunch of other fantastic models in their range and they're out there sponsoring events. They are the official timekeepers of the NBA and MotoGP. And then there is Hamilton, such an iconic and evocative brand name. Connections to military history, there's the Ventura as worn by Elvis, Christopher Nolan movies, they are all over the big screen Hamilton. And of course, when I think Hamilton, I think about their brand ambassador, Daniel Henney. Actually, I don't, I've no idea who he is, but that simply doesn't matter because the brand has such strength elsewhere. And then there's Certina. I must admit, I haven't actually reviewed a Certina on the channel as yet, but that's not because I haven't wanted to. DS, double security, they're waterproof, they're shockproof, they're anti-magnetic, they've got their fabulous looking embossed turtle on the case back, their action diver range, and that signature green color that features on a lot of their models. Which brings us on to Mido. They've been making watches since 1918, and as I said, they've been part of the Swatch group for nearly 40 years, but I just can't think of one standout model from the range. And when we're on the subject of marketing and sponsorship deals, the only thing I could find is that they sponsor the Red Bull Cliff Diving Championships not quite on the same level as MotoGP or NBA. And I think that's a bit of a shame because I think Mido has got some stunning models from their back catalogue. Check out some of these ones. Now, again, I have to be careful here that I'm not just projecting. I love retro reissues, but I know that's not to everyone's taste. And I know that's not, that's not what everyone wants to do with their brand is just constantly rehash their older model range, even when they look this good. They've done it with a couple. This watch here, they relaunched a couple of years ago, the Diver. And then of course there is that range one that I think created the biggest splash that any Mido has over the last five years. So perhaps that's something they should be considering digging up a few of these nuggets. But I digress. Let's move on to today's watch, which is the one on my wrist. It's their newish Ocean Star GMT. They launched this about 12 months ago and it is kindly on loan to the channel from a subscriber from Melbourne called Adam. Thank you, Adam. He also sent me a Solar Seiko. You'll be seeing a review of that one in a couple of weeks time. This is really interesting. It's big, it's handsome, it's classically styled, and it has a Powermatic 80 GMT ETA in the back of it. Let's flip the camera and have a look. All right, Miro, Swiss watches since 1918. Let's get into the box. Decent sized box, cardboard outer. Yeah, I like the color tones. I like this kind of orange and black look. And inside we have our Miro 
Ocean Star in blue. So let's talk price. I did a brief Google for this one. This particular blue model looks like it's going to cost about 1130 USD if you are indeed based in the US. They do a rose gold PVD version at exactly the same price. Somewhat ironically, it looks like the black one on the bracelet is the cheapest of the bunch coming in at 2089 US dollars. I should point out, I am not familiar with this retailer. It was just the best price I could find. Aussie equivalent, I reckon, is about 1420 for this particular blue model. Comes with a fairly thick and fairly unnecessary instruction manual. Also comes with a two-year international warranty. Now, I didn't ask Adam where he got his watch from. However, a quick Google search suggests that he got his from a dealer in Milan in Italy. So perhaps Mido are popular in Milan. I tell you where else they're popular. Mexico. I found this Forbes article from a couple of years ago online, and it seems that Mido have phenomenal market penetration in Mexico. 70 to 75% of $1,000 watches sold in Mexico are Mido's. Well, there you are. You do indeed learn something new every day. And there is the watch. I think it's a fairly handsome looking thing. Kind of understated styles, not flashy or gimmicky at all. I think it's one of these watches you could buy and wear long term. It's all kind of form and function, this one. It's also fairly sizable, 40 millimeters in diameter. I measure it at 13.4 mil thick, 49.7 lug to lug. So it just scrapes in under 50 flat as a pancake case there as well, no curvature whatsoever. So it's just as well that it tucks in under the 50 mil, 22 millimeter lug width. Now I'm gonna give you two different weights today. On this applied canvas and calf strap, the blue model standard, 120 grams. Adam also special ordered the bracelet from Germany. It took several months to get here. It's not a great time to be buying things internationally. On the bracelet, I'll show you on the bracelet a bit later on, it weighs 190 grams. So yeah, it's a 44. It looks like a 44. And on the bracelet, it certainly weighs like a 44. Case finish on this one is pretty simple. I assume it's 316L, like 99% of other watches. Fine brushing on that mid case and a longitudinal brush on the upper lug surface and those crown guards. There is a high polished chamfer running from the tip of the lug to the tip of the crown guards. I like the crown guards, by the way. The crown really nestled in there. It's a good size crown as well with the Mido, just very simple font there etched into it. Still easy to grip and it's undercut as well. So you do have that high polished undercut, meaning it's gonna be nice and comfortable, no sharp edges on the wrist at all. Flat sapphire crystal, but with heaps of anti-reflective undercoating. When I take this watch outside, you'll see it in a minute or two. Yeah, no problems at all with legibility here and a nice ceramic bezel insert, 120 click unidirectional bezel. Yes, you heard that right, 120 click unidirectional rotating dive time bezel. Action. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. That is pretty satisfying. So rather than having a bi-directional GMT bezel and the ability to track a third time zone, second time zone, the GMT hand points to a marked rehote there. So you're using that one to track your second time zone, but you do have a full and proper dive time capability using the bezel. 200 meters of water resistance, screw down crown obviously with this one as well. All right, let's have a look at the movement because apart from the slightly left field brand, that's where the interest for me personally anyway, lies with this one today. So Mido refers to this as a Mido Caliber 80, but obviously being part of the Swatch Group, it's an ETA base caliber, that being the C07.661. Modified version of the ETA 2824, 2892, Powermatic 80. So it has an 80 hour power reserve and it's a GMT. That's the first of its kind that I have seen and I am excited to see this movement appear in other models, other brands within the Swatch Group Empire. I know they do Tissot with them. I would love to see it in some more affordable Tissots and Hamiltons as well as this Mido. So I've half unscrewed the crown to the first pop, nice pop there, and it just manually winds if I roll it forward. If I pull it out to the second pop there, what this does, it's a jump hour. So a genuine traveler's watch. If you are traveling overseas with this one and you're crossing between time zones, you don't have to hack the movements. So you never have to reset it and you don't have to adjust that GMT hand either. Now it doesn't have a quick set date function. So you are gonna be rolling this one around to change the date, 
but because it's a proper traveller's watch and travellers go backwards and forwards in time, you can roll back across time zones, back across the, the international date line as well. If you want to adjust the, the minute hand, I should say, you pull it out, it hacks the movement and you roll it forwards or backwards. And at this point, the GMT hand moves in conjunction with the hour hand. So if you want to set it, you set the GMT hand first and then the three hands thereafter. Interesting, I like it, and I would love to see it in some other watches. Quick look at the case bank before we move on to the dial on hands, and in keeping with that kind of genuine global traveler theme, we have a world time, world time markers on the back. Unfortunately though, it is high polish, so yeah, it is covered in little scratches already. High polish case banks look great the day you peel the sticker off, but they do tend to look a little bit barked up thereafter. All right, let's take it outside and have a look at the dial and hands under macro. And as I suggested earlier on, it's all fairly low key. Nothing too in your face here. It's all quite discreet. There are some nice touches though. I particularly like the handset. So it is a matte black printed dial with middle printed and automatic in white above the pinion and ocean star beneath it. The indices though are applied and we have this rather unusual, I haven't seen it elsewhere, double square at 12, double squares at six, single square at three to make way for a date complication, nice color match date wheel in there in that kind of matte black as well, and applied baton indices everywhere else. All of these indices, whether they be square or rectangular, are fairly simple, high polished silver surround. We do have that 24 hour rehote, bicolor, AM PM with black at the top denoting the PM. We do have that bicolored angle rehote day and night with black at the top denoting night and a dark blue to match the strap and the ceramic bezel insert at the bottom denoting day. More blue here, there's a really nice blue GMT hand that is very attractive, skeletonized with a large prominent arrowhead that hits just to the end of that minute track around the outer edges of the flat dial. Similarly, there's a kind of diamond tip to that second hand also in blue. The hour hand and the minute hand semi-skeletonized like the GMT hand, high polished silver to match the indices and they are beveled towards the edges. There is a bit of loom on the hour and the minute hand but not all the way down, just on the outer edges. And the hour hand and minute hand have a very faint brushing to that upper surface as well. And that is it on wrist. I have a seven inch wrist for your reference. Now 44, normally a little larger than I would go for, but I wore a 44 for about five years, I think 4422. And so long as the lug to lug is reasonable, you get a big watch that wears quite well. And I am so happy that they kept this at a smidge under 50. It means that if you do opt for this canvas and cast strap, it weighs 120 grams. That's perfectly reasonable. And it's not kind of big and bulky. It's not flopping around. It's not overhanging at all. Really nice hardware on this, nice and neat buckle there as well with the Miro brand name etched into it. Nothing worse than a 22 with a huge buckle there, does it no favours at all. So yeah, I think it looks good on me, perfectly wearable and amazing anti-reflective undercoating. My studio light's going full whack here and no glare back from them whatsoever. And that's the overhead shot on the canvas and calf strap. Yeah, it's a big watch. However, once you take into account the bezel and the big angled rehote there, the dial isn't enormous, but still nicely legible. Silver hands, white tipped, white markers on black. Yeah, no problems at all. And that's it on the bracelet. It seems rather conveniently that Adam has a very similar sized wrist to me. So solid links, solid end links. We have got a high polish center link brushing on the two outer links, but a high polished edge joining up nicely with that high polish chamfer that I mentioned running from the lug tip all the way over the crown guards and back again. Now, Mido etched clasp here, we have double security holdovers. It is of course milled, you wouldn't expect anything less for the money, and it does have one of those ratcheting divers extensions. So 200 meters dive time bezel and yeah, genuine dive capabilities with that. I did notice though, only push pins. For a watch at that price, I would have expected screw links. Can't complain about the legibility though. Great amount of anti-reflective coating on the sapphire crystal. I'm moving it all around here for you and you still get a really good clean read on the dial. Plenty of flecto though from that ceramic bezel insert. And that's it on wrist. It's big, it's flat, but it's not massively heavy and it's not particularly unwieldy thanks to that lug to lug just scraping in at under 50. Pretty comfortable strap here as well. Looks like it's been broken in, but yeah, nice and soft on the underside.
So what's wrong with Mido then? Well, nothing that a couple of decent marketing campaigns and a few retro reissues wouldn't fix in my opinion. But what is wrong with this particular Mido? What are my moans and niggles? Well, the loom is not fantastic. It looks okay initially. I assume it's C3 Superluminova. It's got that green color. But if I turn the speed up, Unfortunately, it's the bits that you want to hang on that don't hang on. It's the hands that are the first to fade. Attractive, semi-skeletonized handset they may be, but they could have done with a bit more loom on the hour hand especially, but also the minute hand. And it does seem that this blue-black colorway, which is the most attractive of the three, I think, and the one that a lot of people want to buy, is only available on that canvas and calf strap. So you have to option the bracelet separately and push pins and a bracelet on a watch costing a grand. Yeah, that does feel like a little bit of penny pinching. So a big, handsome, discreet watch with plenty of versatility and a fantastic movement. Big thank you again to Adam for loaning me this one in for review. I hope hope it's not the, the second and final Mido that I review on the channel. Why does nobody talk about Mido? Well, perhaps in Mexico, that's all they talk about. But perhaps for the rest of the world, in other markets and territories, Swatch are happy to let Mido take a bit of a backseat and to promote their other brands for whatever reason. Maybe that will change in the future, or maybe Mido will always be a bit of a sleeper for them. So there you have it. Well done for making it to the end. What's wrong with Mido? nothing at all. If you like the brand, why not check out the review of the Rainbow Diver from last year or the Tiso gentleman that I referred to in the intro. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.